Welcome to our podcast, where we talk about the interesting, frustrating, and inspiring experiences we have as people with strongly held religious views working in corporate IT. We're not here to preach or teach you our religion. We're here to explore ways we make our career as IT professionals mesh, or at least not conflict with, our religious life. This is Technically Religious. Today is May 6, 2019. And while we try to keep our podcast as timeless as possible, in this case, current events matter. It hasn't been a good week, and that's putting it lightly. The U.S. political system continues to be a slow-motion train wreck. Measles cases in the U.S. are at levels unseen since the disease was eradicated in the year 2000. A report on climate change shows over one million species are now at risk of extinction. And just over a week ago, a gunman stormed into a synagogue in Poway, California, This is the second attack in a synagogue in the last six months and part of a horrifically growing list of attacks in sacred spaces nationwide. News like that leaves most people feeling hopeless and adrift and even folks who are part of a strong religious, ethical or or moral tradition who are sensitive to injustice and seek to repair the world, we're also left uncertain on how to proceed. Which is why an article in the Torah and Tech newsletter caught my eye. In it, the author presented the idea that we, as IT professionals, may be predisposed to view these kinds of problems differently and to address them the same way we deal with blue screens of death and ab-end messages. I'm Liana Dotto, and the voices you're going to hear on this episode are the always effervescent Josh Bigley. Hello. And also our special guest and the author of Torah and Tech, Yechiel Kalmanson, uh, who provided the inspiration for this episode. Welcome to the show, Yechiel. Hi, thanks for having me. So I, before we go any further, Yehiel, I want uh, you to have a chance to tell all of the listeners about Torah and tech. I think it's perfect for the technically religious crowd because it merges those two things, tech and, and religion. So where can we find it? How did it start? Just give us a little bit of background. Torah and tech is, it was an idea of a friend of mine, Rabbi Ben Greenberg, who's also like me, an Orthodox Jew, now working as a developer in Israel. We uh, came up with the idea to merge, you know, like you spoke about in the first episode, to have the synergy between these two worlds, which mean a lot to both of us. Um, so we started this weekly, weekly newsletter, which features a Torah thought every single week that relates to tech and also tech news that relate to Judaism or to Torah values in general. You can find it, you can subscribe to it in the link, which will be provided in the show notes. Um, I also cross post a few weeks, those that I write, I cross post them on my blog, which you can find at rabbionrails.io. Fantastic. I guess we'll dive into this. What is it about IT and working in IT that makes us think differently about these types of world breaking, world, you know, horrific events that that just shouldn't be? You know, I, I think what makes me think about those things, and I have an interesting story that I'll share, but it's that that desire to uh, to fix things, to see them resolved, um, and in order to do that, the, you know, you have to understand where they came from. I, I remember quite distinctly when I had this first realization that I was a, a fixer. Um, I was uh, I was in tenth uh, grade. I was in a, a class, and uh, we had a, a presenter from the community, or who I thought was from the community, who came in, and and she talked about. Uh, the genocide in, that had happened uh, in East Timor. Um, she was East Timorese, and she had talked about how the Indonesian army had invaded uh, East Timor and killed off a third of the population. And I thought, man, I've never heard of this before. How can it possibly be that such a tragedy has happened and no one's talked about it? And it was in that moment that I I realized, I, you know, I wanted to do something. Um, and it's only been with, you know, 25 or 30 years of, of retrospect that I realized that that was that transitional moment where I, I knew I wanted to, to be a fixer. So I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, something that happens to us uh, by, uh, by nature, by nurture. I, I, I don't know if I want to fall down on either one of those sides, but for me, it, it felt very natural. Excellent. Uh, now, you feel in the newsletter, you actually mentioned something about the fact that, you know, we, as IT professionals and certainly as programmers and developers, Error messages, we don't respond to error messages the same way that I'm going to say normal people, <laughs> muggles, do. Can you can you elaborate on that? Uh, sure. Um, it's actually, I noticed that it's one of the first things, one of the first like switches I had to go through in order to learn development. Before I, before I was a programmer, I 
the tech support and I can't tell you how many times I got a phone call where someone calls up and says, yeah, there's something wrong. The machine is broken. I'm like, what's wrong? Like, I don't know. It has an error message on it. I'm like, well, what does it say? I don't know. What it like, I, I'm like, I can't really, you know, can, can we go through the transaction again and see which error we got? I don't know. It's just broken. It got an error message. As I mean, ever since I was a kid, I always had this curiosity where I would, you know, try to figure things out, you know, when something broke to try to take it apart. And when I learned to program, so that was one of the first lessons I had to learn because, um, you know, error messages pop up all the time. You make a small typo, you make a small, you know, you add an extra semicolon or you're missing a semicolon and the whole thing blows up at you. And as a muggle, as you put it, um, whenever you get, whenever a computer throws an error message at you, it's always this scary thing, you know, it almost feels like the computer is like shouting at you, you know, you probably did something wrong and now everything is broken and nothing is working. But as programmers and in general people in IT, error messages are actually, that's what we're here for. That's what we do. We fix error messages. Error messages show us where the code is broken, where, you know, what has to be fixed. Some are easier and more helpful than others, of course. But that's basically what we do. Our whole approach to broken systems is different. You know, I mentioned a quote from Steve Klabnik in, my, in, in, the, in the newsletter. He said that programming is a movement from a broken state to a working state. That means you spend the majority of your time with things being broken. Well, if it worked, you'd be done programming. I mean, nobody's hiring programmers to fix, you know, to take care of working stuff. So that's what we do as, uh, that's our job, our job description. How many, how many of us have said, you know, as, as you're sort of struggling with a problem or, you know, how can you keep working on this, you know, hour after hour? Says, That's why I get paid the big bucks. That's why they, you know. No, I just want to call out that the blue screen of death, I think that that was invented to be scary. Like, really, uh, you know, suddenly everything fails and you get this, you know, uh, this dump of, of data. Like, <gasps> that, I don't know. When I see the blue screen of death on the server, and I have fought, knock on wood, I haven't seen one in a long time, I'm always afraid. So, right. And, uh, but of course, you have to remember that the, the blue screen of death came after a, a long string of operating systems that gave you nothing more than like the sad Mac. Like that was all you got. You didn't get any other error messages. So perhaps the pendulum swung a little too far in the other direction of giving more information than you wanted versus just, you know, I'm not happy now. But, you know, that again, even that is to Yahil's point is a way of, of trying to fix things by error. You know, this error message is actually not useful. And so I'm going to fix the error message by giving more information, but they just went perhaps a little further in that direction. So uh, I learned uh, last week or two weeks ago um, about this great uh, Easter egg in an error message. So, you know, when you're in, uh, when you're in Chrome, and there's no network connectivity and you get that you know that pop-up that says that there's no network connectivity there's a video game in that pop-up message trying to make it less scary by looking for fun little things in the middle i will not admit out loud how many hours i wasted with that dinosaur (laughs) (laughs) very good but it is some number greater than zero Good. All right. So, um, so I, I like this, this mindset. I like the fact that as IT people, we, you know, are, are, as Josh, as you said, solvers and that we approach brokenness in a very different way. We see brokenness, not as simply, you know, like a broken, uh, pot, a Ming vase on the floor that is broken and, and will never be, you know, the same, but, uh, you know, more as IT folks where, oh, that's just, that's how everything starts, you know, and now, now we have the work of the work. I'm curious about whether being, you know, religious, people from a religious, moral, ethical, you know, that kind of, of point of view, are we predisposed maybe to see these errors or these patterns differently than folks who are from a more secular point of view? I'm pretty convinced that, um, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, You know, I I think about the, uh, and you know, uh, in case you haven't been paying attention, I am, uh, I was raised Mormon, uh, and I am, I'm now post Mormon, uh, or ex Mormon, or no longer Mormon, whatever it is you want to call it. The artist formerly known as Mormon. The artist formerly known as Mormon. I think actually that is every Mormon because the church doesn't call themselves the Mormons anymore. Anyway, that's a, that's an entirely different episode. 
But the the entire premise of Christianity at large <clears throat> is this um, realignment or uh, uh, yes, realignment is the best way to describe it of ourselves with with God. So God being perfect, um, the idea of there being an atonement means that we have to uh, that there's something um, wrong with us. And so, you know, Scripture is full of uh, indicators when someone goes wrong. Um, so one of the the great indicators in the Book of Mormon, which is the the book of Scripture that is unique from the rest of Christianity inside of Mormonism is when uh, Jesus is crucified and when he dies on the cross. And while there's been people who have said, hey, you know, things are things are not going well, you know, this is going to happen. Suddenly, the, you know, the earth shakes and the, the ground breaks and there's darkness and there's, you know, uh, you know, cities fall and they burn. These are all these warning signs that something has gone wrong. And those people who are, are astute to that, they recognize that, something has gone wrong and they're the ones who you know who raise their voices up and um you know then there's goodness that rises yes i know it's a bit of a stretch to say that in that mindset um we also become good engineers that when we see the warning signs we, you know we're looking for them you know we, we start to see oh my goodness there's error messages popping up like, that's that's kind of weird and then when the thing ultimately fails we are we're also we're the ones who are there to say okay all right it's failed we got this. We can bring this back. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily um, how people perceive it, but I certainly, um, you know, I, I'm certainly a, a big pattern person. And in patterns, you know, whether you're talking about the book of Revelation or you're talking about Nostradamus or whatever it is you're talking about, those patterns all exist. And I think they're powerful for us, um, both personally um, but also from a technical perspective. So I, I think that Judaism approaches things differently. Obviously, you know, yes. they approach things yes. very differently <laughs> for a lot of things. That's that's a true statement. The brokenness of the world is sort of uh, built into it. And I, I don't know that it's it's worth going into, you know, the, the whys and wherefores. But there's this concept in Judaism of tikkun olam, which, you know, translates to repairing the world. And because that's a thing, like the fact that that phrase exists tells you that the world needs repair and that's built into the system. Otherwise, that phrase wouldn't be a thing. Um, now there's two ways of looking at Tikkun Olam, the, the sort of, uh, bubblegum pop way of looking at it. And I probably just offended thousands of people and I apologize. The, the first level view or the easier view of Tikkun Olam is just doing good deeds to make the world a better place, you know, um, you know, donating money and helping people out if they need help and things like that. But there's a, a deeper, slightly deeper level of it, which is that, there are these hidden sparks of holiness and it's almost like a scavenger hunt. Um, and that our job is to reveal these sparks of holiness to collect them up. And the way that you do that is by doing these good deeds. Um, Yechiel, I don't know if, if you have a, a take on that. Uh, no, I really did pretty well. It's stressed a lot stronger in Hasidic philosophy, which is, which I'm trained in. Um, but yeah, the, when God created the world, he He created it with his goodness, with his kindness, and that kindness is everywhere everywhere in the world, even in the darkness. When we find a spark of goodness in the darkness, we're actually revealing the purpose of creation of that part of the world and bringing the world closer to its ultimate reason for creation, which was to become a, a place where godliness and goodness are out in the open rather than hiding in dark corners the way it is now. One of one of the parts of Judaism that I like so much is that certain these you know good deeds these acts um, are are labeled as as mitzvot, which you know a lot of people say oh that's a good deed right no 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 that's that's a commandment that's an obligation you know why are you giving charity or tzedakah is is what it's called in Hebrew why are you giving that you know because it makes you feel good no because it's a good deed no because I'm obligated. To. I am commanded to, you know, the the commander in chief gave me an order and I'm just being a good soldier. I'm just doing it. And I think that that also, as, as somebody with a religious point of view, lets us look at, you know, these these broken moments, these broken times as, uh, nope, that's it's part of the job. You know, th this is a hurdle that was placed here so that we could try to overcome it. Moving forward just a little bit, I, I 
think that because we see these errors, do we do we feel compelled to address them? I mean, like, do we have to? Something that um, something I'm told very often is Josh, stay in your lane, and I'm not good at that at all. <laughs> Keep your nose out of it. Just deal with your stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really, really bad at it. So I, I'm going to say that, yes, I feel very compelled to fix problems, uh, much to my own detriment, though, sometimes. Uh, solving my <clears throat> my own problems is challenging, but solving my own problems and other people's problems, that's, that's a weighty thing. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm better at solving other people's problems than my own. So, yeah, so do we feel compelled to address them? I feel like that's part of what we spoke about, about it, you know, our different approach to error messages in tech. You know, uh, when a, when a non-technical person sees an error message, yeah, he's compelled, they're compelled not to do anything about it and just shut the whole thing down and turn it on and hope that for the best. But as a developer, if I see an error message and figure, okay, it's broken, that's it, that's how that, you know, that's how it is, then I'll pretty much find myself without a job very soon. Um, well, there's, there's one phrase that I think I've quoted on the show before, but it's, it's so good. I can't let it go. You know, do we feel obligated to, do we feel obligated to address these in, in, uh, one of the books of Mishnah, um, a section called Pirkei Avot, uh, there's a phrase that gets quoted a lot. Um, you're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. So, and, and I think that's a big part of the mindset um you feel of the three of us you are the most uh the the most a programmer um i'm more of a systems guy josh is more of a systems guy um and i know that when you're looking at one of these big problems like you said you can't walk away from it but at the same time i don't think you go into it thinking well it's me and it's only on me and there's no one else who's ever gonna do that I, I think you know going into it that there's a team behind you there's people that you can rely on there's people you can go to or who will pick up the work if you have to take a break or put it down yeah, that's or very take an app very true the stuff i'm working on now are, you know it's problems that we're around for a lot longer than for a lot longer than I've been on them, and they will still be problems way after I'm off the team already. And yeah, it's you know you're part of a, you're part of a much bigger picture. You are not you know you are not the be all and end all. the The project will go on without you, but at the same time, you have an awesome opportunity to improve it and to move it one step forward and another step and another step. And and I, I have to put this in here because I said I'm a systems guy. Really, you know, my my great love in IT is monitoring, uh, and I consider myself to be a monitoring engineer more than anything else. And and I think that uh, I feel compelled to address things because usually I'm the one who sets up a monitor to watch for that condition, um, to check and you know, is it healthy? No. All right. Why? And once you have that, once you have that error message, that alert, hey, this is no, no longer within the boundary of what we would consider healthy or good or up or okay, at that point, um, if you haven't put in something to try to fix that problem, that, that alert that you've just triggered, then you haven't done the full job of monitoring. Um, you know, monitor, collect the data, alert when it goes out of your specification and then act. And if you're not acting, then you haven't done a full job. That's from a monitoring standpoint. But again, I feel that it translates into the real world. Um, so, you know, now that we've sort of identified it, I wonder as IT folks, do we have anything to offer non-IT people, again, muggles, to approach these problems? Is there is there a mindset that, that non-IT folks can adopt that would make it easier when they see these big problems in their community, in the world, to not feel so overwhelmed? Oh, me, me. I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> so okay. there, there's, this great, uh, there's this great idea in Mormonism um, about having one foot in Zion and one foot in Babylon. And I don't know if it's, it's strictly from Mormonism, but I feel like I'm one of those people uh, because I was afraid of error messages in my early IT career. I was absolutely horrified. I, it, to me, when they broke, it felt it felt like I, I had done something wrong. Like, did 
did I did I make it do that? Like, you know, uh, to quote Steve Urkel, did I do that? Uh, <laughs> Another that, great voice in geek. Uh, uh, that's right. And, <laughs> in technology, yes. The, the great geek of all geeks, right, Steve Urkel. So I think that I would love for people to to take this. Don't be afraid of of, of error messages. When you see them, you know, first, they, you know, decompress a little because you're freaking out because things just broke. But then read what the error message says. You know, this is not like the Twitter fail whale it, thing. It's not like the the spinning pinwheel of death on your on your brand new MacBook. Like these things are uh, are generally helpful, and if not, shame on you coders for not putting in helpful error messages. Uh oh, right? he's throwing shade at you, Phil. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean a little. No, that's actually <laughs> a very um, it's a very valid point. And in our last tech conference I was by. It was a Ruby conference, but almost every talk, like I mean, almost every talk I was at, was trying to discuss how to make our error messages better. And I think in general, just teaching people that it's okay when things are broken. It's not okay when they, you know, it's not okay when they stay broken, of course, but it's okay when they are broken, and that just shows that there's room for us to get in here and help things out. You know, and I love that idea of making our, our error messages better. Um, in going back to Leon, your love of monitoring, my love of monitoring, the big push now in the monitoring space is that everything is telemetry. It's not just time series data, like mm -hmm. everything, your error messages, the, the, the strings that get vomited out of your code, that's all telemetry. So yeah, please, if you're a developer and you're listening, ma make your error messages uh, something that we on the monitoring uh, and event management side that we can take in as telemetry and use it to, you know, to help people to go and do things to bring the systems back. Right. Now, I'm not about to go and, and approach God and say, um, I'm not sure your error messages are, uh, are comprehensive enough. I, I'd like things a little clearer, um, partially because uh, it's a little uh egotistical think that I have anything to tell God about how to run the world. And second of all, when I've asked for clear messages, I've gotten them and they're usually very sort of blunt and uh, brutal. So I don't do that. But um, as far as having non IT folks, you know, approach, you know, these world issues, these sort of error messages around um, one of the things, and we hit on it earlier is, is remember that you're working in teams that uh very rarely in IT are you an army of one, uh, that there's people that you can fall back on. There should be people that you can fall back on. Find, you know, your tribe. If you have, uh, there's an area of the world that really bothers you, that you're sensitized to, then find your tribe that's addressing that, whether it's the Me Too movement or you're fighting, you know, climate change or you're looking for, you know, creating lasting peace in your neighborhood or anywhere else. Um, you know, find that group and work within it so that you can pick up your piece, but you don't have to try to pick up the whole piece. So that's one thing that I think IT folks sort of intuitively understand. So I love that. And I want to build on that. My son today, uh, who's in high school, he came home and he said, um, hey, just so you guys know, uh, today's the first day of, of Ramadan. And I, I'm going to be participating in Ramadan with my uh, with my friends. And I thought, oh, like, whoa, wow. we're like, where did that come from? That's so awesome. Um, he's feeling very connected. And so I love that idea of finding your people. Um, and working in teams, I have this this wonderful old lady who lives next to me. She's uh, you know, she's been around forever. And uh, whenever her computer breaks, she she calls me and says, you know, Josh, can you come fix my computer? She you know she knows how to do the things that she knows how to do, but she also is very willing to admit that I I can't do this. I can't fix this thing. And to me, they're very rudimentary. Like, okay, yeah, I, I'll help you with that. But to her, it's it's something uh, foreign, and don't be afraid of foreign things. Uh, admitting that you don't know something is is just as good, if not better, than faking um, that you know something when you don't. I mean, our last episode talked about that. That fake it till you make it. Um, right. Well, you don't have to fake this. You, right. It's okay to say I don't know. Thanks for making time for us this week. To hear more of Technically Religious, visit our website, technicallyreligious.com, where you can find our other episodes, leave us ideas for future discussions, and connect to us on social media. To quote five-man electrical band from their 1971 classic, thank you, Lord, for thinking about me. I'm alive and doing fine.